So community spread means that people who don't have an identifiable risk factor, like travel from Wuhan or travel from Italy, uh, come in. And, and when you start seeing people who have the new coronavirus, who, who, who don't have an identifiable link, that's what we call community spread. And it really means that we have to change the, the testing paradigm. I mean, you know, initially our only concern was for basically travelers. Now that it's here, if it spreads in the community, we'll have to suspect coronavirus in people you know, who haven't been out of Cleveland. I think there's a lot unknown, and I think it's possible people could, people could get it again. I'm pretty confident if you did get it again, it would be very mild because you would have a good uh, immune system. I, I, there's so much that we don't know yet. I mean, this is a disease that's like three and a half months old, and you know, literature and papers are just starting to come out. Well, what I, what I hope we are is that we can slow community spread by social distancing. And this is really critical, and this is a message I want to get across. You know, this, this started in China, and it, when it was in East Asia, I, I, it felt kind of distant, but then it exploded in Italy. And Northern Italy is having a health crisis because of the rapid spread. So we may not be able to eliminate spread in Northeast Ohio, but it's crucial to slow the spread so we don't see a surge in sick patients that goes beyond the capacity of our, our healthcare system. Italy is, Northern Italy is having a crisis. I mean, they, their hospitals are overloaded. They, they, you know, they, they lack ventilators for all the patients that need it. So what I hope happens is people disaggregate, people socially distance, people do social isolation and we, we slow the spread. Uh, and you know, ultimately, we slow the spread. Maybe we stop the spread at some point in the future. You know, we'll get a vaccine at some point in the future. But in the next two weeks, people need to take seriously the idea of slowing the spread. And people that are not at risk for getting very sick, you know, kids, teenagers, young adults, they need to take it seriously because they can get sick, a mild illness, spread it to others, and ultimately, it gets to their grandparent. The governor of, of the state of Washington was asked, you know, you know, why should people do this? You don't want to kill your grandfather. That's why you should socially distance. Yeah, I would consider uh, children with, with a heart condition, you know, I, I don't know details of their condition. I'm not a pediatric cardiologist, but I think um, people with, with heart or lung conditions in general would be considered higher risk. I don't know if it's true for children because the illness so far has been mild. Everywhere in the world, it seems like it's been mild in children. So I don't want to make her anxious. Uh, and I just don't know. In general, it's mild in children. That's a great question. And um, I would be in, you know, I'm not in charge, but I would be in favor of what they did in Japan, you know, closing the schools for a month. I mean, it, it's a big deal, and I think our government hasn't wanted to do it. But, uh, you know, and they made a decision in Japan. They made the decision one day, we're closing the schools. They closed the schools the next day for a month. I think part of that, I think Japan was highly motivated to try to get it under control quickly for many reasons, but one of them was because of the Olympics. And, and the key message is, you know, kids in school are very, very, very low risk for having a severe illness, but they're the ones that can spread it in the community. And that's why I would be in favor of closing schools. I don't think we know that yet, but we do know that a lot of people have a very mild illness, don't need to seek medical attention, and they can be contagious. Okay. Are people with allergies or asthma at a higher risk? I think if you had severe asthma, um, you know, where, where you required hospitalizations and that, and that sort of thing, you, you might be. I think if you're a young adult with mild asthma, I would not think you were at higher risk. So people should be worried about spreading that in the community and the coronavirus, you know, leading to mortal illness in the frail elderly and other at-risk groups. So on a bad flu year, there's about 40 million cases, about 800,000 hospitalizations, and about um, 60,000 deaths. It's, we're still getting a handle on, on this illness, but every indication is the, the rate of mortal cases is, is you know, either 10 times or, or more than the flu. The, and the key is keep the spread down by social distancing. We really need to do that. And it's not that, you know, we didn't, we didn't cancel the MAC tournament crowds or, the, or March Madness because we are worried about those people getting sick, worried about those people continuing to spread in the community and then the elderly dying you know, of, of coronavirus. This year's flu strains did seem to affect young adults more, and, and that's sort of unique from year to year. So far, the data we have in the coronavirus is, you know, kids, teenagers don't get a serious illness, and, 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 mo and young adults, it seems really rare that they do. 
but we have to stop the spread uh, to avoid situation in Italy where their hospitals are overwhelmed because it spread so much, the vulnerable patients are getting really sick. That's a great question, and it, it, it may help a little bit, but right now, coronavirus is spreading in countries who are having their summer. So people probably saw today that Tom Hanks and his wife in Australia, at the end of their summer, have coronavirus. And presumably they got in coronavirus. So I think it's overly optimistic to think that more sunlight and warm weather will really slow things down a lot. It, it might help somewhat. In the, in the flu epidemic of 1918, it did slow down in the summer and then picked up again in the fall. If that happened, we might have a vaccine by fall, which would be fantastic. One more comment about the flu epidemic, about this idea of social distancing. In 1918, the city of St. Louis decided to, to sort of have, you know, cancel all their events, cancel school, et cetera. They had much fewer fatal cases of influenza than cities that didn't do that. So this concept of, you know, stop going to events that are more than your close family and friends. We need to do it. Yeah, I, you know, personally, I'm not an expert in vaccines, but obviously as an ID doctor, I, I'm a big supporter. And it, 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 it doesn't take that long to produce a vaccine, but to do the appropriate testing. You know, Dr. Fauci, I'm sure people have seen him on, on TV. Dr. Fauci, I think, really has been the, the spokesperson from the expert medical community. And he's saying eight to 12 months, maybe the most optimistic people might say six months. I don't want to give the impression I'm an optimist, but um, it, it has to be, un, in addition to being developed, it, it requires appropriate testing to be, you know, to make sure it's gonna be the appropriate vaccine. So it's not gonna be here by summer. I think that's highly unlikely. Yeah, it, it travel's a tricky one um, because I, I think people who are at high risk should not travel now. People at low risk who have essential travel should travel but take precautions, which include strict hand hygiene, trying to stay away from people who are coughing. Don't travel if you're sick because you're gonna spread this to somebody else. You know, maybe wiping down your tray table with a, you know, alcohol wipe, that sort of thing. Um, I think if you're in a community where there's community spread, the risk of traveling is probably not that different than being in your own community. You shouldn't travel to an area where you know there's lots of community spread, which of course, you know, regions of China, Iran, Italy, um, you know, Japan, Korea, um, et cetera. In the United States, Seattle, parts of Northern California, and now New York City or some suburbs of New York City. As I'm sure many of the listeners know, the governor of New York is sort of quarantining a whole suburb uh, because there's an epicenter of spread. Sure. I think every big um, healthcare system, every big hospital in the United States is, is developing their own in-house capacity. And it requires you know, getting the reagents, developing the tests, et cetera. I, I don't think the volume is going to be huge. I think uh, probably in, in most hospitals will be, you know, less than 100 tests a day um, in, in the short term. Uh, it, commercial labs are doing tests, et cetera. I think at it, it, it our hospital, the in-house testing will probably be prioritized for patients where it's going to make a quick difference on how they get treated and that sort of thing. Yeah, the, the, the test done by the public health, by the Ohio Department of Health, by the CDC, it requires your permission. So they have their own criteria, which are changing a lot. So there's the public health test, there's commercial labs, some of the large you know, companies that do testing have tests now, and we've sent some. And then I know that I think every big hospital is developing their own in-house capacity, which may expand, but I think will be somewhat limited in the beginning. I, I think the testing numbers are crucial to, to identify when community spread is starting. You know, what happened in Seattle was, Community spread went unrecognized for six weeks and it got out they, before they really took measures. So I think if we had a do-over, you know, we would have started like, doing sentinel testing to see where it is earlier on if we had the capacity. So I do think expanding testing is important. The great majority of people, you know, especially people under the age of 60 who get coronavirus, are not going to be sick enough to need to go to the hospital. So the test isn't going to make a difference in their lives in that the test is not going to identify an illness for which they need medical care. You know, there's no known proven treatment for coronavirus, and mild cases don't need to go to the doctor, don't need to go to the hospital. Um, people may want to know, and there may be a reason to know, but it, it's not going to change the management of the patient, you know, whether they're tested or not, if it's a mild case. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's painful to mention, but I think she is. So in Italy, the average, more, you know, fatality has been 80 years old. 
and, and it seems to be a much more mortal disease. And so once we have community spread, I think we're just at the beginning in community spread. I think we're, you know, many weeks behind Seattle, you know, behind, weeks hopefully behind New York. But as we see, you know, more and more community spread, you know, people who are elderly should probably socially isolate. Kid, you know, kids have mild disease. They're much more likely to spread it. And so, you know, having contact with a lot of kids, if someone's elderly and at risk for a bad case, is something they should avoid. You know, one of the CDC leaders said two or three weeks ago, this is going to cause disruption in our lives in a significant way. And, and, and we're seeing it. You know, the NBA, the March Madness. It, it, and so, unfortunately, I think this disruption in our lives is something we have to accept, deal with in the short term. And, you know, and people need to take it seriously and they need to socially distance. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I, I think that's a great answer. So, or a great question. Mild illnesses, you know, people get better in two or three days. And there's, there's a whole spectrum. I mean, there's people that end up on the highest, most technically complex ventilator we have. And there's people who, who are sick for a couple of days. So I, I don't have a better answer than that. I mean, hand, hand hygiene is key. And I suppose if, if you shake somebody's hands, then, then do alcohol-based hand sanitizer or wash your hands. I mean, you know, people can get it from being next to somebody who's coughing. The, the infectious particles don't last that long in the air. Uh, uh, but obviously you can get it by being next to someone who's coughing, that, that sort of thing. But people can get it from, you know, touching a surface that has the virus and then touching their mouth, their nose, their eyes. You know, I'm a, I'm a baby boomer and I read newspapers, you know, my... Young doctors I work with think that's an odd habit. But, uh, but you know, I'm, I'm tempted to turn the page. You know, so I've, I've become very mindful of habits where I might touch my, you know, my, my, uh, my mouth. So I think people should observe hand hygiene, wash your hands frequently, you know, 20 seconds with soap and water. The virus is killed by, by good washing. 20 seconds with soap and water will kill the virus. So frequent hand washing, don't touch your mouth, nose, or nose, nose can minimize spread. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I think if you're gonna if you're coughing and you're gonna go to a public place, you should either avoid going to a public place, or that might be an indication for a mask. We don't think people should wear masks if they're well. But you know, coughing into the elbow is an effective way to help you know kind of uh, not create droplets in the air. So all around the world, in East Asia and other countries, they're trying some uh, antiviral medicines, etc. There's no known medicine to be effective. You know, from Vietnam, there's some anecdotal reports, but these might have been in patients who are getting better anyway. So I think all the big hospitals have already have some protocols for some of the medicines that might help. But what's really important is to try to get any patient that needs medications in a, in a clinical trial so we can learn. Because if you just give medicines to people without really studying whether the medicines work, you'll never know. So there's an effort nationally for the patients that do need medicines. And the great majority of patients, certainly you know, 80% or more will not need medicine of any kind. Those that get really sick, I think we're going to try different medicines, but we're going to try to do it in a way that we can learn from it. Great question. So really, uh, shortness of breath, you know, fever, cough, and then shortness of breath would be an indication to seek medical care. And I think it's really crucial that people call ahead. You know, whether you call your doctor or whether you call the ER, if you're concerned you have coronavirus, don't show up in a busy waiting room. You don't show up in a busy waiting room of a doctor's office or an ER. Call ahead and, and say, I'm concerned. You know, if, if you show up uh, in a clinic before you're, before you're around other patients, they'll put a mask on. They'll, you know, if you show up in most ERs now, if they think you might be a, 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 at risk, they'll put a mask on. They'll put you in your own room, maybe with a filter or negative pressure. So we don't want people showing up in doctor's offices or ERs and, and treated routinely, if, the, if you think it could be coronavirus, you need to identify that right up front. Yeah, I, there's different reports on how long the virus can live on an inanimate object, you know, whether it's eight hours or 24 hours. Um, but I think when you go in public, wash your hands frequently, hand hygiene, don't touch your mouth, nose, or eyes, and you can really minimize your risk. Well, it's a, it's a great question because um, the, the public health infrastructure in general in the United States is not super robust. And, and the large healthcare systems that are, are basically private, I mean, they're, most, they're not for profit, 
you know, obviously Metro is a county hospital, but the Cleveland Clinic and UH are, are private, not-for-profit institutions. When there's a public health crisis, there has to be a partnership between public health and the large institutions. I mean, the, the Cuyahoga County Department of Health doesn't have a hospital. You know, they, they don't have you know, hundreds of doctors that work for them, so it has to be a partnership. Wash your hands and try to, try to stay within six feet away if anybody's coughing. And you know, people are going to get other viruses and, and develop a cough. But I think it's the socially appropriate thing to do. If you have a cough, don't go out. I mean, you know, it's complex. People have jobs, et cetera. But as much as possible for voluntary activities, if you're sick with a cough, don't go. I strongly believe that we need to start canceling gatherings. I mean, people should spend time with family and friends, but large events with, with you know, more than 25 people, more than 50 people, whatever, we should, we should put it into it. I think that's where we're going to see spread. I think, you know, where the, the March Madness crowds were canceled, not because we we're worried about everyone getting sick, we're worried about ongoing spread. And I can't emphasize enough how important it is to slow the spread so we don't have a, a spike of really sick people and overwhelm the healthcare system. I think it will definitely go down because I think the first wave of patients in the United States are people who are sicker. So there's probably more mild cases in terms of the overall death rate. And, um, and it seems to be different around different parts of the world. I, I think it's highly likely that it's gonna be more than influenza. Influenza is 0.1%. You know, I know that um, you know, the President Trump said on the Fox News interview that, oh, it's, I don't think it's 3.4%. And he may be right. The 3.4% may be because we're identifying the more severe cases. But the key message is, Nobody in the world has immunity to this, this virus. Certain groups can get really sick, you know, elderly people with chronic heart and lung conditions, and it's serious. So if the death rate is 0.5% and 100 million Americans get this virus, that is massive. So we need to slow the spread. I mean, the CDC website is excellent. You know, and, and Dr. Fauci addressed this in one of the press conferences because one of the reporters said, well, there's you know, 80 million Americans that have preexisting conditions. But people with routine, routine high blood pressure, that might be considered a pre-existing condition. I don't think they're at risk for severe illness. People with well-controlled diabetes, I don't think they're necessarily a risk group. It's really people who are elderly, however you define that, <laughs> gets, goes up each year for me. And, um, and you know, people with, with serious lung disease, you know, pe the, the lung conditions that, that require a lot of medical care. People with serious heart conditions that require a lot of medical care. And you asked a question earlier. I think a young, healthy adult with mild asthma, I don't consider that a, a significant issue. You know, someone who's in their 70s that has severe emphysema, very high-risk individual. Who knows? Maybe protective. I mean, one of the interesting things in kids is there's a theory. And, and, you know, there's before there was this coronavirus, there were six infected humans. You know, SARS and MERS, which we probably don't have time to talk about. But there's four common cold coronaviruses. One of the theories in kids is that they get these a lot, and it's kind of build up some resistance to the new coronavirus. Yeah, I, I think big events, like b big banquets, big, big, you know, mixers. I mean, there was this horrible story from Dartmouth where a, a medical type person uh, had traveled back from Italy, was told, you might have coronavirus, don't go out. And this person went to the business school mixer and exposed a bunch of people. I mean, people need to exhibit responsible behavior. You know, it's really important to try to slow the spread. So I think any any large gathering where there's people you don't normally associate with, you should avoid. That's why I say, you know, close friends and family, co-workers, you know, that's part of life. But voluntary events where you'd be exposed to people you don't normally see on a daily basis, you should absolutely avoid. I mean, you should stay away from people, stay away from public, public spaces. You know, it's sort of self-isolation. Self, you know, self you know, quarantine means you're not sick, but you're staying away from people. Isolation means you, you have the illness. Okay. But yeah, I mean, stay home, don't go out. Stay away from strangers, you know. Yeah, I think getting enough sleep, which all the doctors involved in coronavirus are not right now, but getting a lot of sleep, eating a healthy diet is, has been proved to in, increase your resistance to infection. So that, that's always good. You know, exercise, don't smoke, you know, that, that sort of thing. But I, I think that the message is, you know, there's people who poo-pooed this and not taking it seriously. Look at Northern Italy. We don't want that to happen here. We need to be active.